when I was five, when I was at infant school, um, in break time, the I think it was an older class. I think it was probably the eldest class of that, mm. the the infant year, or infant years, and they had all this art in the room, or yeah, in the room and on the windows. So that attracted my attention. I went to go and look at it, and I thought, wow, this is this is good. This is the class I want to be in when I get older. So I remember that as being quite key. Eventually, I did actually get into that class, which I thought was great, but it wasn't quite what I thought it was going to be. Um, but it, it didn't it devalue my first thinking of what art was. It just looked, um, you know, the most exciting thing to do, sort of thing. So when, <clears throat> when I got to... Um, Oh dear, where am I going? There was a, okay, there was a moment when I was in middle school, when I was about 10, and we were given a project to design an Easter egg, I think it was the first one, and we were supposed to dye it, and we used, we used wax to decorate or something, and people were doing all these patterns and stuff, and, and I just, it took me forever to kind of get to the point of thinking, oh, I don't know what I'm going to do. And so I ended up just kind of just like pouring wax all over it. <laughs> so it's quite a complicated pattern, really. And the what was interesting was that you know then they're all they're all dying, they're all on the on the sink. Um, and the following the following day we go in and we all go and get our eggs, or told to go and get our our eggs. And because mine's not there. <laughs> And I can't quite remember what, exactly what it looked like, but I know definitely the one that was there was not mine. And so I'm, you know, I say to the teacher, you know, that it's not the right egg. And what had happened was that the guy next, the guy who sat next to me, had taken it <laughs> because he thought it was better. <laughs> and so I thought, oh, that's kind of interesting. And I just thought, I you know, I thought well, I could let him have it, but then I thought, well, that's wrong. You know what I mean, but I did, you know, it was kind of, it was interesting because he suddenly, you know, it was like suddenly there was an appreciation of something I'd done, I suppose. And I just, you know, and um, I'm probably not putting this very well, actually. But that year, I do remember that we then made a few other things. I remember making a racing car out of paper mache and stuff, and it worked really well. Or at least I thought it did at the time. And there were several things that year that just seemed to make art a good thing then the next year there was um we did um a, a, there was a um one day in the week you did some kind of arts or something and so i ended up doing pottery for six weeks or something i can't remember what the period of time was and um to be honest, I was a bit scared. They had these plaster moulds and I didn't know what I was doing. The teacher didn't really give too much direction, but so somebody said, oh, you just press clay in it or something. So I pressed clay in it and all that kind of stuff. And then I started using a knife to get it out. And somebody said, no, I'll kill you if you do that. <laughs> so I was thinking, oh, shit, this is not... You know. So I forgive my language there. The, um, so, but anyway, I, I then, I was, I was, I did, there was a guy next... Sorry, this is a long way of getting to the, the final thing, isn't it? Okay, so um, the guy who's next to me is a, is some um, somebody called Robert, and we get on really well making these creatures and stuff. He'd made things with teeth and everything, and it was the really good fun. And um, he was a mathematical. As far as I was concerned, he was a mathematical genius, and I wasn't. And I didn't think I had a, 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 have anything in common with the guy. And suddenly we could link on this level, which I, you know, I thought, well, that's amazing. And, but it was great. It was, it was good fun. Um, and at the, uh, I can go back to tell you something later about that. This doesn't act, okay, I should say it now before I forget. This doesn't have a bearing on anything that happens later, right? Except that the teacher was um, a Welsh guy called Ralph Carter, who also taught rugby. And because rugby was good in those days, wasn't it, on the world side, and like it is now. And he's on a parents' evening, he said to my parents that I was a potter in the making. 
Now, my parents never told me that. You know what I mean? It's, it's much later that I found out this conversation. Um, <clears throat> but, they, they, you know, so the next year, just before I go to secondary school, again, we do the pottery and it's, and it's fine. And when I go, when I get into, when I'm, when I'm at school, there's only two subjects that kind of really are mine or that I enjoy really, you know, um, so it's sport and art. And though I kind of do sort of averagingly well, I would think it's everything else, you know, the other, those two were the key ones, but the art was the overriding thing. So the art class was always the place. And I, there was a guy a couple of years above me who I particularly remember because he, whatever he did, they, you know, it was always good. You know, they would have it on the wall in the art room. So when I went in, I was going, wow, God, if I could do something like that, that would be brilliant. And so that always, that always inspired me to, you know, to try harder, I suppose, or something and I suppose at that time when I got into the fifth form sixth form I was beginning to think well if ever I could create something like that that somebody you know I could do the same thing that that picture or whatever he's done to if I could get if I could have that effect on somebody else that would be really good so therefore that's probably what I should do but having said that to get into to actually get to that level I did require a bit of pushing I suppose because I wasn't confident at all so it was the art teacher mrs lusher that when it came to trying to make um, a career decision you had to be a big career advice and the career advice really wasn't very good and the so mrs lusher said that i should go to art college and because she said it i thought oh yeah i'll go then and um, even though my best friend at the time was already you know he had already applied um so i suppose that's that's why I'm a maker, really. So it's education where that aspiration came from. I don't think it's education. I think it's just that I, you know, it's, it, you, it's within the educational mm. thing, isn't it? But it's like, I, but as I say, when I when, the, when I'm at, when I'm five and I see that classroom, nobody's telling me to look at that classroom. So what happens is I'm just going out to playtime, aren't I? And I, I see this thing, these things in the window, and then I peer in, and I just think, "Wow, this is great." So I'm, I'm drawn. Nobody's told me anything. You know, I just like what I'm seeing. So I think that is kind of the key thing, and I think that's what it's always been. Do you know what I mean? So the educational aspect does come in, but I think it's, 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 um, it's later isn't it? Somebody tells me or shows me how to do something. But there's no other creative influences from family members or friends? No. Your upbringing, no. Not in that, okay. not in that way, no. Okay. Well, craft is often considered an immersive activity. How does this apply to your own practice and what is the balance and approach between cognitive thinking and haptic or fine motor skills? I mean, obviously education being taught obviously has an impact because otherwise I wouldn't know how to make anything so yeah that is there are there are certain things that have definitely influenced me in terms of looking at books I mean David Pye I mentioned earlier I think he's written two good books um, I think Bernard Leach's Towards a Standard the first part of the book I think that's really good um, I suppose that informed me I suppose I it kind of made I, I, yeah I read it and I and I agreed with it. I suppose that's what it is. And then um, I think that within the education, I think the one thing that um, when definitely when I was doing the foundation, somebody can tell you how to do something. It's like you were saying um, earlier today about you could go online and you can see how to throw a pot. And that is a way, in a way, it's, it's in a way, it's okay. Um, but it's the actual, it's the actual act of doing it that actually informs you. So you, you're given the rudiments of how to do something and then it's the feeling of doing it that make, is the key bit. And I remember when somebody was just um, at the, when we were doing live drawing once, the teacher um, 
was trying to explain to me verbally how to do it kind of thing well look you know if you look here and this and blah 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 but actually in but in the end what he did was that he got hold of the crayons that I was using or whatever and he kind of showed me literally by doing it with his hands in front of me and and that to me was the best way of teaching I thought okay now I can, now I understand what he's getting at so suddenly I'm then doing it sort of thing or at least trying to do it and uh and what about during the act of making? Are you, you know, are you were constantly reacting to the properties of the material. Obviously, working in clay, do you find that? Is it almost emotive the way that you? Sorry. Is it almost emotive the way you approach your making because you're responding to that material? So it's it's, um, it's quite instant, isn't it? If you're throwing on a wheel. Yeah. So you haven't got time to consider the next stage. You've got to react to it. Yeah, I mean, you always, yeah, I think you always have an idea that you're starting with and then in the process of making something, um, a feeling, mm. whatever it is, comes through, sort of thing. Um, oh, damn, what was I thinking? I was... Um, when... Um, I think the the the, the, difficult, the difficulty with making something is is the you could be you could be a good thrower but you could throw cold pots and I remember seeing a photograph in ceramic review once and I just thought these pots didn't they didn't have any life about them so there's a problem it's not just about technique there's something else and that's probably what Bernard Leach I think is talking about in his book and it's a, it's a, it's kind of a feeling. It's like when I was um, carving out of polystyrene um, the leg that you know I've made as the model, kind of thing. It's it, though I wouldn't say it's a good leg at all. I do. I when I'm doing it, there's part of me trying to get the feeling of whatever I'm, there, you know, of a foot, whatever I believe that is. And it's that I think it's that mo, it's that moment that something something happens but actually it's outside it's it, it's outside a certain type of control i think if you yeah okay now i don't know if this is actually really answering the question but if you if you make if i try really hard to do something and do it right what i tend to think is that i'll fail so what happens is that you can you what you do is you um you know what you're going to do but you've got to feel your way to it rather than put it into action you've got to it, there's a kind of it's a prep it's a preparation so for example in the morning when i get up if i go on the wheel the chances are the first half an hour is not going to be the most productive, even if I'm just throwing a regular beaker kind of thing. The first one may work, but definitely the seventh one's going to be the best. And then the, the and then usually I'll go off and have a coffee, um, come back, and then I'm kind of ready because I've like prepared myself and I'm now feeling kind of right, I suppose. I I think there's I okay I think there's an analogy between um sport and art in that I, okay i used to play badminton a lot and you can learn all the techniques and you can learn all the the right shots but actually in the end that's not enough there's got to be there's got to be something else there's got to be a bit of i suppose it's a bit of feeling whatever it is um because otherwise it's just, um, yeah, it's just cold and it can be read because it's a formula. So the formula is only, the formula is a kind of a, it's like they, okay, so you have the, God, this is rambling, isn't it? If you have um, <coughs> a, a thing that you're trying to follow, you could say that the, the golden mean is what you one should uh, try and attain. So, but the, problem is is that if you do it literally 
it doesn't really work. But if you if you do it so that it's following generally, but there's slight variations, then it'll work better. So if you look at um, I think when I was at school, I remember there was we did a drawing of um, a sunflower head, and there's a mathematical kind of progression thing to it. But problem is that it's not actually correct. It's it's all slightly out, and that's why there's the beauty to it. So I think that's yeah that goes back to the Bernard Leach thing I suppose. So there is that angle. And as you've progressed through your career, and do you feel that your prior education, both your specialist education, mm -hmm. and your undergraduate studies, and even things and um, skills and underpin knowledge that you've gained through state education, have they come to have an impact or contribute to the development of your practice? Yeah. I think if I hadn't, if I hadn't gone to, well, yeah, well, I think all the all the tutors that I ever met, and, and also the students that I was with, if I hadn't have had them, I wouldn't be the person I am today. Um, I'd like to think that the, the the Roy Risdale, who was at Lincoln, actually understood me. Um, I'm not quite sure. Um, he definitely taught people slightly differently, and I always felt as though, like you were saying when you were at college, that you, you know, it can be, um, you know, you, you know, he never tore that piece of paper up in front of me and said no, and he never did that. But he did tell me that I did things wrong. But he did. Um, I think he he forced he forced me to either do what I was going to do or not. And I think he realized that I wasn't going to be just um, a convention. Well, convention is the wrong, is the wrong word probably. I wasn't just going to just make a pot. That wasn't what I was going to do. I was going to do something else. I was going to make, um, um, what would it be? I would think a little bit outside the box, which is always, I think, actually, I think art, art does that in general if even if you make a teapot you know you could argue the best best teapot and I do remember when I was younger going to a little cafe place um, in a little shopping area and they had a brown betty teapot and the brown betty teapot is a great teapot but there's no point in making a brown bit of teapot anymore because it's been done so it's there's something else and I think that art um, so what was the question? It's about how your, your prior education, whether it still contributes um, to your understanding and ongoing development of your practice. Yeah. 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 I think I'm not quite sure I was going with my tangent actually on that one. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I think okay. One one of the yeah okay. Yeah, so that was personal tutors, wasn't it? Or who were help you know who helped in a certain direction, I suppose. And that um, I suppose that gave me what Roy Risdale gave me was the the push to be more creative, I suppose, which he probably saw that that's what I wanted to do. Um, but he also gave me, also was testing me out to see if actually I could live live under a pressure, which is obviously going to happen, where somebody's going to say that's no good. And if I could live through that part, then I could probably make it. That's the way I like to think about it. So I think on that sense, I think it was, yeah, I think he, 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 he was good. The one thing I'd say about the art education that I did do was that I tried to keep everything open. So I didn't want to, um, I wanted to do everything, you know, I would, so when I did the degree at Manchester, it was wood, metal, ceramics, glass, and there was a bit, we could do a bit in the fashion department at one point, which involved making jewellery and stuff, but it was, you know, so I would be quite happy to go that sort of way. And have those transferable skills gained from the different specialisms? Have they contributed to yeah, I think they your do, practice? Yeah, yeah. yeah cuz you bring in I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, different ways, that, yeah, different using different materials, different tools. You can, you know, you could make one, you can combine
the different ones together. So I think I always wanted that as a potential. But I did think that clay was obviously going to be the, the clay was going to be the thing that well, I was probably going to go back to because that was the thing that I you know you look back and I guess that I go what was the thing that I really enjoyed the most. Yeah, and it was obviously that. So following on from that, following on from that slightly, are there any other, um, additional factors which contribute to your ongoing practice? Are there uh, external influences or particular processes, or is it something that you could, you know, something that you've reflect on? Are there any handing down of skills that you picked up from other people, either contemporaries or maybe from something longer term, which influences your practice? I think you, when you talk to people, sometimes you can, you, you may be able to shift and think about something in a slightly different way, or they may give you something that you could. Um, but I don't think I seek it out necessarily. It just kind of happens, I think. So. Okay. And how do you see the future of craft, both in its present guise? and in response to global, political, social, economic and environmental changes? Oh, um, I think it... Uh, I think the crafts do have a... OK, I did... Uh, there's an article I should let you see, because I wrote, I wrote it ages ago. Um, it did get kind of published in a small way, in South Wales Potters, and it was to do with... Um, Oh, what was it? No, oh, yeah, okay. So what it, the title was not designed for industry, and there was um, okay. So the crafts council or the art world, the craft world, whatever it the the crafts try to the craft should stand on its own. It doesn't need to hire, It doesn't need to be connected to art in the fine art angle as such. It can be, but it's not. You know that kind of just raises the price in a way. Um, the the industrial route again. It's like why um, why would you why why do sorry I'm not explaining this very well am I? Uh, yeah, I think the, the the there's a value of craft, and I think it's the value of craft that is the is 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 key, and that should be valued for what it is. You don't need to tack on the art; the art is already inherent in it. I think the the idea of the art is the is the price thing. The industrial bit is is they. I think somewhere you you said something. Wait a minute, what did um. Okay, going back to David Pye, I did write this down earlier, didn't I? Um, in one of his books, he talks about the the quality of finish of things done today. That are if you go if you go to the V and A, you would see a whole range of different types of finishes. Whereas today, you see a more standardised type of finish. So you, you, we, we limit ourselves, which is not a good thing. That's where the industry can kind of come in, I think. Um, do you feel that people value craft? Some do, yeah. Um, yeah, so I think, yeah, so, yeah, so that co the quality that he was talking about then, I think is probably, it's gonna get, it could get worse. Um, which I don't think is is is, um, is a good thing. Um, there should be more of a, there should be a variety of objects, a variety of finishes, and that and that's kind of where they definitely the crafts can come into that. I think um, there was one thing. I don't know if you want to know this bit within the article. There's um, I shouldn't even say this, should I? There was a I probably shouldn't mention names. <laughs> There was a pot. Well, it's in the article actually, so it doesn't matter, does it? Um, except it's not on tape. No, there's a, there's a potter who was asked by industry if he would design some domestic ware, and he th then obviously thought about it and thought, you know, should he do that? I mean, he does make domestic ware. 
you know, but he hand makes it. So should he do it? And he then decided to ask a very a highly established ceramic artist in this country um, what he thought about it. And this highly respected <laughs> ceramicist said, yes, I think this is really good. The industry is taking an interest and that they should do it. You know, they, yes, this is, this is good, you know. And, and I was just thinking, okay, you've got two things. Number one, if you ask the question, basically you know the answer already. And the answer isn't yes, the answer is obviously no. But the, the next thing is, is that when you say that industry is interested in, say, putting craft in front of the word of the object that they're selling, actually, that's not what they're interested in. What they're interested in is trying to get into that market, which they're not part of. So actually, they, they value what the crafts can offer, but they want part of the pie. So that's not a good that's not a good link for the crafts, I don't think either. I think we you know we should just stand stand as what we are and at whatever level that is, be it more fine art orientated or more domestic or cottage, whatever. So you feel that maybe the the word craft is banded around too much and sometimes it's not appropriate. Yeah. 